Hello and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Anusha and I will be your host and moderator for today. Welcome to Mike's webinar series, Road to Recovery, Episode 7, Public-Private Partnerships, the Funding of Smart City Development. With us today, we have our distinguished panelists. Our first panelist is Mr. Jeffrey John Dalmon. He is a Senior Public-Private Partnership Specialist with the World Bank since 2005, advising globally on infrastructure finance and public-private partnership. He is also an author and numerous books and articles on public-private partnership. Our second panelist is Yang Dipatua, Town Planner Haja Noraini Haji Roslan, President of the Subang Jaya Municipal Council. She has served as President of Subang Jaya Municipal Council since 2018, with 20 years diversity experience in urban planning with its focus on sustainable city. Our third panelist is Madam Maslina Wati Ahmad. She is the Head of Economic and Research of Group Strategy Planning, Bank Pembangunan Malaysia Berhad. She has 24 years of experience as an economist with well diverse experience in senior capacity in various organizations covering a multitude of subject matters, stakeholders, and durable. Our fourth panelist is Mr. Azrin Aris, Director of Central Strategy Economic Region, Telecom Malaysia Berhad. His current focus is to empower Malaysia state government and local council towards digitalization and smart city through innovation, innovative business models and leveraging on TM's asset. Ms. And our final panelist is Mr. Bakhtia Zainal Abidin. He is Malaysia Smart City Alliance Pro Tem member on finance. He is also the CEO of System Printy Syndrome Berhad and is involved in system development, data management analytic and data professional training program. Today, um, Mr. Azrin um, will be joining us from a workshop that he's conducting uh, with Majlis Perbandaran uh, Kelang. All right, so that's what you can see a huge crowd there. Yeah. All right. For in today's episode seven, we are discussing on public private partnership, the funding of smart city development. Cities around the globe realize the need to streamline their infrastructure and system to improve the lives of their residents with the latest planning paradigm of smart city development. For example, ICT infrastructure elements such as fiber optic networks that laterally function across sectors to become the core attribute in overall smart city system. These fundamental raise both opportunities and challenges for the city's authorities from funding and financing perspective. A clear version is necessary for a better collaboration and the sharing of risks and reward with the private sector. Public-private partnership are an increasing preferred method for cities development. Regardless the business, human and city coalition as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, now require city to initiate new methods in coping with the difficulties. A swift involving planning environment needs to happen. An integrated end-to-end -end plan is required to replicate operating scenario within all inclusive financial model. This is because the effect of COVID-19 will remain and even expand further far beyond any given MCO period. Malaysia financial institution must prepare to weather the inevitable economic slowdown and these inventable effects. Also, all smart city development plan in the pipeline. Now, I would like to start asking Mr. Jeffrey, has we all aware smart city stakeholders are growing with positive commitment from federal, state and local levels? Marketplace is varied and complicated with the convergence of cross-cutting needs. Can you share with us uh, the big picture of the public-private partnership globally and international example, especially on the funding models and practice as the cities 
over the globe face the mass COVID-19 pandemic aftermath. Mr. Jeff. Excellent. Thank you very much, Anusha. It's a, a complex question. Um, my name is Jeff. I'm from the World Bank. Uh, the World Bank is an organization that provides support and assistance to lower income countries, the various poorest countries in the world, but also to middle income countries. So a lot of countries that have very sophisticated approaches to problem solving. Um, and in that context, I am a PPP specialist. So I run around the bank advising different teams and different sectors on how to do public-private partnerships. And for those of you not familiar with the terminology, it's, it's a very simple concept. Public sector is good at some things. Private sector is good at some things. And the two can come together and work together to solve problems using their respective strengths and the idea is that if it's done right, then the sum is greater than the sum of its parts. So together they can be even better than they could be separately. Um, obviously that's a really challenging thing. Anyone who's tried to build a joint venture or a partnership or a, a company and you know bringing together even just individual people with different skill sets and getting them to work together is challenging. So I have a lot of work to do. I get to run around and advise lots of people. and. Um, I must say working in cities and municipalities is one of my favorite things. When you work in a particular sector like power sector and you think about PPP, you think about power generation, power transmission, power distribution, all the different bits and pieces. And but it's relatively linear. You're thinking about your sector in cities. You guys have to think about everything all at once. Everything you do touches on so many different parts of the economy of the social aspects of the city, of the political aspects of the city, you have to think about things more broadly. Um, and so that's my number one bit of th my first thought on PPP. To be good in PPP, you need to be flexible. You need to be able to think outside of the box. As governments, we tend, we, we look at things delivered publicly. So I'll work with the private sector, but I'm gonna hire them to do a specific job build this building, you know, manufacture a pencil and deliver me a pencil. It's relatively linear. But here in PPP, it's a relationship. You have to think about things in a much more dynamic fashion. And that can be difficult because often our rules internally are designed to keep us focused, to keep us tight, to spend public money efficiently. And what PPP demands really is that we open our minds and we think about the private sector as a partner. And part of that partnership is communicating, it's sharing, it's being open with this partner that you now have in ways that you're not usually open with a supplier or a contractor, but here it's a partner. And in smart cities, this is even more important, right? Smart cities is, super innovative and creative and dynamic and we're thinking of new ideas and new ways of doing things we have to express to our private sector partners what we really want our nervousness our concerns our issues and then get the private sector to do the same the private sector is equally as confused equally as frustrated and nervous right and they're risk averse and all of this stuff is happening and they're working with a partner that they don't really understand Private sector is as confused about government as government sometimes is about what drives private sector. Um, so that partnering is really, really important to make a PPP successful. Um, and I guess last is specialist skills. It's often tempting as a city government to act like we already know everything, like we know what we're doing and we need to be confident. And that confidence is really important, right? There's nothing. It, um, walking into a meeting with strong confidence allows everyone else to relax. But in that confidence, we need to be honest about where we need help, where we need support. And there are going to be a series of technical specialisms that you may not have internally, and which means bringing some of those specialisms from the outside. And sometimes that can be difficult, but again, flexibility. We need to be open-minded. We need to be bringing in these technical specialists to help. And so whether that's legal, whether that's commercial, drafting up contracts, thinking about 
what's driving the project commercially finance on the financial side sometimes ppp can be quite complex financially because we're asking financing to come into a long-term project not just build me a house but now it's going to be a long-term provision of solutions and so that technical specialism is going to be really important and being open to bring those specialists in but also watching them very carefully specialists just like everybody else they have their own way of doing things and they need help understanding what you need and being having that confidence to stand with them and to help them understand and to push them to deliver what you need delivered so let me let me stop there but that's my those are my three big things flexibility partnership and then being open to bringing in that specialist support to help you deliver so that would be my opening self Anisha. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, we understand that city need to touch on everything and to mm -hmm. have it to be good in PPP, we need to be more, much more flexible. All right. And yes, we need to address the, the demand from the private sector. You're up, you nail it right. <laughs> All right. Now I would like to go to town planner Hajan Raini. The Subang the Subang Jaya Municipal Council has the vision to become an international renowned city based on the smart city, business city, and ideal resident by 2030. MPSJ is one of the successful municipal which is able to sustain with minimum government funding. How does MPSJ address the challenges on funding and financing model to carry out the smart city projects or initiative. Thank you, Danisha. Thank you, yes. Anisha. Sorry, but Danisha <laughs> is my neighbor's daughter. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everybody. Subang Jaya, like any city in Malaysia or all over the world, aspires to become a smart city. I think that's become the tagline for all cities um, nowadays. Um, and Malaysia has launched this um, smart city framework that every city can refer to on how to initiate, how to uh, progress along with your uh, program and strategies towards becoming a smart city. But how do we actually achieve it? I mean, saying it, uh, putting it in a strategic plan, putting it in our local plan is one thing, but implementing it is another thing. And the first questions that always comes to every city is about the affordability. Can we afford to be smarter? Aren't we smart already? Or how smarter can we be? And who can help us to be smarter? So I think uh, in approaching these um, questions on our journey to become a smart city, one thing that I can say is that we cannot do it alone. We do need partners. And in choosing our partners, we need to know them better. We need to know that they understand our problem. And anybody who comes with a business proposal to a local council, not only come because they are there to make money, but to also provide a solution to alleviate the pain points that the city uh, residents are experiencing. And most importantly, that the project is feasible and sustainable. So for a city, almost all of us have our own strategic plan. And for Subang Jaya, we have a smart city as one of the core strategies. What do we try to achieve by uh, saying that uh, to be smarter? It's all about a faster and more efficient service delivery. How do we smartize our work process? How we make it? How do we make it more efficient? How do we make it better? How do our decision making can be done better with all the data, with all the information, with all the analytical ability, with this new AI? But how do we um, adopt that into our daily decision making? So that, that that is number one. It's all about a better governance, a more uh, efficient governance, a better service delivery. 
in order to do that, you must understand what are the pain points. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about partners who wish to be partners with us. I mean, you don't come with a proposal because it's what you can do, but what, what is its use to the city? Okay, uh, Partners may have various solutions and, and, and they are good at selling, but do we want to buy it? Every city has to decide whether that is the solution that we want um, giving the amount of money that we have. Okay? I'm talking about affordability again. Uh, identifying our pain points, that has to be done by the city itself. Uh, the smart city framework done by the um, Kementerian Perumahan and Kerajaan Tempatan have already uh, guided us on which areas that we need to focus on. I mean, we will go to smart economy, we will go for smart living, smart environment, smart people, smart government, smart mobility, smart digital infrastructure. But out of all that, which one do you want to focus on? Um, in Subang Jaya, we go back to the people. What are their pain points? What are the, their wishes? Which priority that they want to see done within this year, next year, and the next year? Because normally strategic plans will take for five years uh, to be uh, planned and to be implemented. So once we have prioritized these pain points, um, we need to identify the right partner to provide the right solution because um, the ability of, of officers within the local government itself are limited. We are burdened with daily process. Sometimes we do not have enough um, manpower to think about the way to do things better just by coping on daily things. Um, we are, we are so overwhelmed already. So there comes partners, um, people coming to you with proposals. And the first question that I would ask is, do you understand what we are doing, uh, what we are trying to, um, to, to ease the, the, the um, problems of the citizens? Uh, and if you have a solution, how can we afford it? Um, I have one example. I mean, uh, Azrin is here from TM. We have a collaboration in SS15. It is for um, two, three things in one. We're trying to have a safer city, more women friendly. Uh, secondly, uh, we have um, a proposal for a smart, smarter mobility to ease the traffic so that the waiting time at the traffic light won't be too long so that we can synchronize a few traffic lights using a smarter solution. And um, in order to afford that, we have this smart parking system that can increase our revenue by 20, 30%. So this is one example of a partnership that understands what we need and provide a good business model that will enable us to afford the system. So, uh, so do um, example with other partners. Uh, I'm partnering with uh, Smart uh, Slango Delivery Unit and also Smart Cells. They provide the uh, integrated system for um, our um, uh, domestic waste and cleaning services. Uh, they are also helping us with the smart uh, traffic management system. Uh, they are also coming with the integration of the um, complaint system and the action that is being done on the ground so that we can see it uh, in our command center. Uh, and this uh, system uh, can be financed uh, through this collaboration because we have a way of financing it later. In the beginning with the Slango government, of course, they will sponsor some, but eventually we would have to afford it. And uh, increasing revenue through the smart system is one uh, example. Uh, again, with SSDU, we go through smart parking. And um, there are other collection revenues. Uh, for example, a payment online, which can become a new source of income for local authorities uh, with another partner. Um, a third message that I want to um, send out today is that a local authority doesn't have to have a lot of money to start to on their journey towards smart city. Um, my command center cost me only 500,000. It's a renovation of the old uh, um, usage um, 
and we combine it with our call center, we combine it with the monitoring station, we combine it with the uh, CCTV room. So now it has become one room where we can see our integrated system. We integrate that with the uh, executive information system that have the map and the overlays of, of all the cities. And now we have combined it with the movement of our uh, vehicles coming soon, uh, but now we are starting with the uh, enforcement on the ground uh, so that we can communicate with them better. So Anusha, if I uh, can reiterate again, one, that we cannot do it alone, we do need partners. And as a guide, just look at the framework that the KPKT have provided us, it will be a good um, path. And thirdly, um, the partners need to come with a business model that makes it affordable for all of us. Maybe I can, uh, I should stop there first, Anisha. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Rua, Madam. All right, uh, you have a good point that uh, implementing is the most important part in developing smart cities development and a good planning is required and how you spend your budget and how you fulfill what's required for your city. Your, you need to prioritize, which is right. And you are, there's another point that you said, we cannot be alone. We need partners heading the pathway towards smart cities. And with partner, you can deliver things faster and smarter way. Our, our next panel, panelist, is Madam Maslina Wati. Smart city development require external funding or investment, which acquire both public and private sector to have good collaboration and partnership. Can you share any uh, funding model suitable for industry and municipal on smart city development? Ms. Maslina. Hi, good morning. <clears throat> I'm Maslina. Um, um, basically, I'm not the operations um, person yeah, to talk about uh, credit and funding models and things like that. Um, I'll be speaking as an economist, plus I'm wearing the hat of this uh, Bank Pembangunan Malaysia. Okay, um, so being a bank, we are acting like an intermediary, no matter what kind of funding models you have, because I believe um, different projects, different locations, different types of, um, uh, what do we call this? Uh, it, was, it was going to be a medium term, a long term initiative and whatever. You will require different types of models. And there are a lot of um, funding models for this. Okay, so it's just not um, uh, PFI or private finance initiative or privatization. There are a lot more to that uh, in recent years. Okay, so as a bank, we are just acting as intermediary. We are linking these partners, the public sector and the private sector. Yeah. So at Bank Pembangunan, we don't have specific funds allocated or dedicated per se just for smart cities. Okay. As we know, smart cities is actually an interconnection of uh, uh, digitization to serve the people, uh, to improve the transport uh, modes, uh, communications, utility, uh, utility services, and et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera towards building this uh, smart city. So uh, we can see that it cut across many sectors, okay? But of course, being a smart city, the ultimate goal is to achieve sustainable development, uh, yeah? So uh, when we approach the credit, um, uh, what you call this, uh, required for this kind of projects, the way we approach these projects are just the same as any other sectors, okay? Uh, with the exception of uh, two things, okay. Um, during the budget 2019, the government has announced specific funds uh, to be, what do you call this, to be uh, disbursed uh, by Bank Pembangunan, which is Industrial Digitalization Transformation Fund, and the other one is Sustainable Development Funds. Okay, so as we can see, smart cities related projects they fall either you know between these two types of funds okay digitalization or sustainable development funds so if the private sector approaching us or the public sector approaching us for funding and if this project falls within this uh, any of these um, funds 
they will be eligible for 2% uh, subsidy okay, from, from the um, financing rate. Okay. On top of that, if it's uh, related to public sector, for example, the PDT, we have a Kwasatan Patan, on top of that, uh, we will have a special, uh, what we call this, uh, uh, financing uh, rate for them. Uh, instead of charging them base uh, financing rate, we will charge them at cost of funds. Okay, so that is the exception, the, what you call this, the advantages or the special uh, privileges given to uh, public sector. And if it's a digitalization or sustainable development related projects, then they will get additional 2% subsidy. Okay, because it's under uh, government uh, budgeted funds. Okay. Uh, so, for example, uh, just to share uh, with you uh, two projects that uh, Bank Pembangunan is financing currently. One is the smart uh, parking project. Uh, that one is, I think, is in Penang. That one is for Majlis, uh, Majlis Bandaraya Pulau Pinang and Majlis Perbandaran Seberang Perai. Okay, that's one thing. Another one is the um, replacement of the street lights. Okay, uh, should, uh, we, they are changing it to the uh, solar uh, LED lights, and this one is under the Majlis Bandaraya Shah Alam. So those two uh, one, uh, example of projects that uh, Bank Pembangunan is financing. So again, I'm saying that we are just an intermediary. Okay, uh, we we don't think that there is uh, what we call this a specific uh, funding model that is actually you know fit size uh, uh, for ev for every project. Okay, so it depends on the location, on the type of uh, projects, whether it's a long term or medium term, what kind of initiatives, uh, does it involve, you know, um, whether it's really costly, you know, whether it's a PFI better or privatization better, it all depends on the on the type of projects. Okay, so you're just intermediary. Uh, what I can share with you is that uh, we, we have all these funds, uh, we can help you. Okay, so if you have a progressive pattern, you have a special rate. And if it's uh, digitalization related, uh, sorry, digital, digitalization project or sustainable development projects related to smart cities, you have uh, the two percent subsidy. Okay, Anusha, back to you. Thank you, Lynn. Looks like there are a few other options of funding from Bank Pembangunan, which is, um, which is uh, will be beneficial for the municipals in Malaysia and also industry players. And uh, basically, I understand that uh, Bank Pembangunan doesn't specific any funding model, but the funding uh, types will be beneficial, right? And yes, yes it's good that uh, uh, now you have the, let me just recap, digital, uh, industrial digital, digitalization funding and sustainable development funding, yes. right? Yes. Okay, all right, all right. Now I'd like to move on to uh, Mr. Azrin, and he's live from the workshop at the Majlis Perbandaran Kelang. The growth Hi. and Hello. hi, all right. The growth and performance of smart city project need substantial investment that are difficult to fund within the existing financial model. In the situation, in this situation, public-private partnership seems to be a, a, the appropriate to beat the scarcity of public finance and cut on the public spending. From your experience, can you share with us some of uh, TM's public-private partnership model and example of collaboration with municipal in developing smart city initiative? Mr. Adrian, please. Thank you, Anisha. Uh, Assalamualaikum and very good morning to everyone. Uh, just to share a little bit, uh, TM is as no stranger to PPP. We started uh, in the early of 2000, uh, where Telecom Asia and the government of Malaysia embarked on a PPP program to bring the nation from copper-based uh, uh, communication into fiber. I believe that everyone knows the HSBB project is one of the mega project that TM and the government of Malaysia has embarked uh, in the early of 2000. But what I would like to share today, PPP is not only for mega projects, not only for core infrastructure, but uh, we can also bring that closer to the community, closer back uh, to the uh, municipalities or the PPTs. Okay, bringing that into context of our uh, seminar or webinar today, 
actually today I am in a hall together with 24 council members of Majlis Perbandaran Kelang. Just, just to, sh to share with you, what we are trying to achieve is to really make PPP successful between a private and public sector. Okay, uh, let me just recap what Jeffrey has said before. It, we, when we go into PPP, we have to be flexible. Right? I heard about thinking outside of the box, right? I heard about the process has to be different. I, th I heard about communication. Uh, I heard about bringing in all these uh, subject matter experts. And then when it, go, when it comes to Puan Hajah Nuraini, uh, the private needs to really understand right, what the private or the, 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 the PBT wants, not only just bringing in products, right, but to really bring in a solution. When we talk about solution, it is not like, okay, here's a product, please pay me. Right? Those are vendor and supply, uh, sorry, a vendor and a customer kind of relation, which is the traditional way of doing things. Right? But when we talk about PBT, it's purely about partnership. Right. For example, MPG and myself, when Hajar Raini and myself I spent like one and a half years just to really understand what does it need to bring MPG or, or any municipal to a certain level. Right. So the, the same thing that we are doing today with MPK to really understand the requirements of our clung so that instead of just us from TM just bring a solution here, this is what I have. Right? But what do we really need? Okay, what will be the most impactful project that can benefit the people of Klang, for example, in, 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 uh, in, in our workshop today? Right? So coming back to the question of uh, funding. Right? So this is where the challenges of any municipal. To start on a smart city project, you need fund. Okay, normally the normal way of getting fund is to request from external. But the question is, what happens if the fund exhausted? Right? So for example, you start on the project of smart traffic light. Okay, the requirement of that project is let's say a billion. And we managed to get a million ringgit of fund from external, be it from the government or be it from the banks, for example, right? Okay, what happened after that? The moment we start to the run the service, there's always what I call the maintenance of the project and there's no more fun. So that is where all this initiative, all the good intention of the, 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 the PBTs fits. So this is where TM, we come in not only to bring in products, but a total of solution, right? Covering the, not only the solution, but also the business model. So how do we do that? Is first we need to really understand what types of services that we really we really want, right? So in this case, what we do is there's always two types of services in any municipal. There are services that are what we call a cost-driven services. There are services that revenue generated services, right? So what by understanding these two types of services what we're trying to do is to increase or optimize the cost of the services that are using fund okay and to optimize the services that are generating fund so the incremental of revenue that we're getting and the reduce of cost that we are saving those two we take it out and put into what we call a smart city fund for that particular Municipal. So with that fund that we can generate consciously, we use that to subsidize new services that uh, we are trying to uh, introduce to the for the benefit of the people of that local, uh, in this case, MPKLANG or MPSG. Right. So when you ask about what are the examples that we are doing, those are the two examples that we are working today uh, from telecom working together closely with and pick lung and also MPSC. Right. Back to you, Anisha. Thank you, Mr. Azrin. It was very clear. All right. Um, you understand that uh, public-private partnership is on the mega project 
and it can implement in a small project of smart city with a proper model, progress, and players. Right. So, of course, there will be issue when the funding is exhausted, but uh, based on your planning that you have, I think that will be a good example for other private sectors and municipal to follow the lead. All right. Now, I would like to go to Mr. Bhaktia, our final panelist. Smart cities are more than conventional physical infrastructure. Cities must embrace the a diversity of methods to fund finance smart city projects. It is important to recognize different set of funding models. Is there any uh, is there any funding model or models that city authorities in Malaysia may find useful or can be applied? Mr. Bakhtia? Uh, thank you, Anisha. Uh, uh, Assalamualaikum and salam sejahtera to all. Uh, yes, a very interesting question. Okay, uh, a bit of my background. I'm uh, I'm presenting um, Nation Smart City uh, Alliance, which is a body which consists of uh, a lot of uh, private organisations that actually provide uh, services and developments to uh, a, a host of uh, government sectors. And also private sectors, and we come in model all sorts of models. Uh, so my view here is basically coming from the private sector view. I hope it applies to the uh, municipal council authorities <laughs> when they apply for financing. But anyway, uh, there are several funding models that can be adopted by open city authorities. But first and foremost, uh, as uh, I think as we heard from other panelists, that we have to ascertain the business model and the nature of funding that is required. Um, for example, uh, the a traditional uh, sort of uh, environment, which is to build, operate, and transfer model, uh, is a traditionally uh, traditional outright purchase model, which is obtained by contract awards. And this is actually funding which is coming directly from public sector. And the project is normally short term, between one to five years, and it's fully transferred back to the municipal council once the project is completed. In this scenario, the contract financing and project financing is adequate for the implementation of the project, uh, of which uh, the release of funding will be depending on certain timelines, which have been agreed by both parties, by the municipal council and also private sector. And that, that's one uh, of the models that we have. The second model is more related to managed services model. Uh, here again, um, a lot of this is basically providing services only to the uh, municipal council. In this kind of scenario, the private sector will have to invest uh, fully uh, on the system first before it is being, uh, and the municipal council will only pay according to services rendered. Now, uh, this is normally a, a, a situation whereby the contract uh, period will be a lot more longer maybe between 5 to 15 years um, in order to regain back uh, the investment cost and uh, probably a reasonable profit also at the end of the day. Uh, here, uh, the, the, the requirement is probably of like a long-term lease uh, based on the uh, portfolio of the company and also on the project uh, information. Uh, now, uh, the, ease, uh, the, risk, uh, the risk is only to the vendor. So uh, the potential income and revenue growth is key in getting the potential financier or investor uh, to join partner who can also co-benefit from information and obtain from data and services. Okay. Uh, the final one, which we are talking about today, is the public-private partnership model. This is basically a joint public and private investment. On the other hand, uh, it involves investment from both vendors, which is private, and municipal council, which is public. And the proceeds from the project is to be shared by both parties. Now here, the key in, uh, thing here is to actually be able to monetize the benefits of the social economy, uh, which we hope to deliver in the project itself. Uh, so it's, it's very important to ensure the success of investment and to realize the value it can bring for both to the both parties. Now, if the, the, the growth and income can be shown, uh, then it will be enticing for a better public-private partnership in the long run. Okay? 
Uh, so those are basically my, my thoughts on this. Uh, Anusha, back to you. Thank you, Bhaktia. All right. Uh, we understand that there are several funding that we need to understand the business model and the funding basically based on the time period and focusing on long term or short term project. And I think that will be a good uh, options for industry players and also municipal. The key important is to increase the value for both parties in, in toward the success of the smart city development. All right. Thank you, Bhaktia. Thank you. All right. Now I have some key question and some I received from the audience also via YouTube. All right. Um, I would like to ask um, Mr. Azrin first. All right. Um, what are the necessary preconditions for PPPs to be more widely applied in smart city development, especially in the light of accelerated urgency in technology application in many aspects of human life post COVID? Okay, uh, basically, uh, the, the core of PPP is all about within itself is partnership. When you talk about partnership, it is the willingness of both party to actually share the, the gain, the revenue, but at the same time, the willingness to share the risk. Of course, in, in, in the case of what we are trying to do today with Majlis Bantaran Kelak, it's actually to understand atau memahami apakah risiko-risiko yang bakal kita hadapi, right? So I, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm trying to have this uh, dual leg yeah, it's okay. for, for the benefit yeah. of people inside. inside, 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 inside. Right. It's fine, it's fine. Right. Okay, so, so apabila kedua-dua pihak or both parties understand the risk, okay, uh, whether it's the revenue that we are going to get or the risk that we are going to face, then only a good business model we can build. Kita boleh bina satu business model yang lebih baik. Okay, bila kita ada satu business model yang lebih baik, dan kita tahu apa risikonya, and dan kita telah jalankan study seperti mana yang kami jalankan di MPSJ, okay? So, so we have done a study in MPSJ for six months in terms of parking, untuk parking, untuk memahami how, what are we going to get if let's say we run this technology for six months. And based on the study, then we know that if let's say we put this technology on, this will be the gain. This will be the revenue gain now. Based on that, kita juga cuba fahami, okay, what if we get that 100%, 80%, 50%, 60%, what will be the value that we are going to get? How much are we willing to share in order to cross-subsidize to different projects? So this is what I believe what Jeffrey, uh, sorry, uh, Jeffrey said. PPP needs a lot of complication. This is also what Juan Hajar Rani said that we need to really understand. So all this are the core of PPP. It's all about partnership. Bila kita bercakap dengan partnership, kita tak boleh nak pergi dari segi okay, the normal procurement way. So there's a tender, there's a, but, but of course, there are governance. But we need to find ways on to, to make PPP work. Okay, right? So. Thank you. Ah. Madam Maslinawati, what do you think about it? Uh, you on mute. <laughs> Sorry, because of the COVID-19, um, uh, the whole world, not just uh, cities or, you know, uh, Malaysia, uh, the whole world, yeah, uh, we are actually uh, being pushed uh, towards the acceleration of adoption of the technology. But uh, with regards to um, planning for smart cities, because I think we are still at the early stage of you know having all these things together. Uh, so just, just don't just like because it's technology and COVID nineteen, you just bulldoze and you just focus on technology uh, adoption and whatnot. Because you really have to take stock of what you have for your cities. Because as I mentioned, different cities, different requirements, different kind of framework. So you cannot just have one size fits all. Yeah. So basically, you have to look at. Uh, um, what are the things that the the cities need 
first okay and if you want to to put in technology or if you want to to accelerate the adoption of technology because basically technology is is the key thing underpinning the smart cities um, design you you have to make sure that you have the proper infra first secondly you need to make sure that uh, the transformation uh, uh, you know um, among businesses towards this digitalization towards automation is it in in place yet or not because you can't have you just throw in um uh, uh, uh what you call this uh, infra such as technology and it's, it's not being embraced it's not being adopted widely i think in a way the objective you know defies the purpose okay um so that's the key thing you, you need to take stock what your cities need okay uh of course you have to align to whatever is actually uh, already uh, being um Laid out uh, in the smart cities framework, uh, and you should prioritize um, things that are actually more needed first, not just the what you call this the adoption of um, high end technology, just to keep pace, you know, with whatever other people is doing, just because of this COVID nineteen. So yeah, so because when talking about um, PBT, we are talking about you know small uh, uh, uh Majlis uh, Perbandaran, not just Majlis Bandaraya, not just like, you know, uh, cities like MBSA or, you know, uh, Subanjaya, or you, you you really have to look in a perspective for the whole nation, okay? So, to make sure that, because even if you manage to develop one smart city within, let's say, Subanjaya or Sha'alam, and you are sort of disconnected uh, with the other cities or the other small towns in Selangor, then tak guna juga, you know? So, you need to have the whole ecosystem actually you know they they grow together whichever uh whoever is at, at the what you call this at the faster end of this uh phase of uh, uh digital digitalization or you know smart uh, sustainable development projects whatever go ahead but you need to allow these small small towns to catch up as well so yeah back to my earlier um statement just you really have to take stock you really have to look at what are the needs, the, the urgent needs of your cities. Maybe your cities need, uh, you know, replacement of uh, street lights uh, first before, you know, looking at uh, what you call this e-commerce, you know, connecting all the, the, the people in the cities and whatnot, things like that. So we cannot just be blinded by this because of COVID-19, acceleration of technology, so you just bulldoze into technology. So, yeah, that's my, my, my insights into this. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. Right, my next question. What is the financial landscape of municipal and industry player in supporting smart city development? Town planner Haja Nuraini, maybe you can take up this question. This is the most difficult question to all local authorities. <laughs> you want to do a lot of things, you want to be smarter, but you can't afford it. Um, the questions about affordability can be answered. Um, like uh, Maslina said before, it is prioritizing. What is it that you really need that will help your city the most? <clears throat> not just because the neighbors have it, the Joneses have it, not because the big cities have it and the smaller cities want to have it too, but what are the most pertinent um, issues that needs to be resolved within that city? prioritize that and how to do it uh, you can't do it alone select a good partner how do we know that a partner is a good partner i mean um it's like a marriage like i mean you get to know them for for quite a while but in the long run it's quite a gamble but assessing your partner needs some assessing of yourself also um suppose we are to embark in a project once we have prioritized it we have to embark upon it um, the way Subang Jaya does it is to have this living lab. I mean, uh, with the project proponent, I want you to show me that this project is um, doable and sustainable um, given a short period of this trial time. Okay, six months, uh, do it on the ground. We want to see what's the problems with this solution, uh, whether it can be improved. Um, but at the same time, it gives us an opportunity to know each other. Um, and of course, doing due diligence of that particular companies. I mean, if it's uh, TM, for example, I mean, 
everybody knows them. It is a big company, it's a government-backed company, so it's not so much a problem. But there are many companies who are proposing to change your LED light, saying that they can change all of them, the whole city, and we don't have to pay a single cent for the next how many years. I was very skeptical of that proposal from many years ago because technology changes very fast and the way they package it is that the payment uh, that is paid by the saving from the uh, utility uh, bill will extend for over 20 years, which is, I said, this is ridiculous. Uh, after six or seven years, the technology changes itself and you may not even be there to, 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 to change it, but we still have to pay you. We made some mistake before with the uh, CCTV camera. We paid a large amount of money for what is now good for, I can buy a new camera every month for what I have been paying for the past how many years. Mistakes like that should not be done. Um, of course, um, um, sometimes we are asked to do things, um, but if local authority have their own say on doing things, you should know what you can afford. You should know what to spend on the best with the limited resources that you have. Um, given a project, you see what the um, cash flow looks like uh, in line with the technology life span, because a technology can only last a certain years. Nowadays, these LED companies come with a new proposal saying that it is affordable to be paid within five to seven years. I'm happy because within that period of time, technology changes, the bulb itself, the, the housing, the um, whatever technology that goes with LED uh, would have changed. And uh, whether the company that exists or not, at least I have overrun the warranty period and the, the, the time that I need to maintain the, the particular uh, item. We are talking about infrastructure. You need to know the product, who produces it, whether it is a solid company who are producing it, whether the maintenance is going to be okay or not. If you are talking about a system, uh, a system can be too complicated, which we don't really need. What we need is a simple solution on the ground. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about to my staff this morning that, that you know have this wonderful system, but in actuality, when the user use it, they only want certain things only. So. In the end, we have to restructure that application to make it easier, simpler, and cheaper, which is actually what we need. So, um, back to your question, Nisha. Understanding our own ability to pay for a certain project, understanding the lifespan of the project, selecting the right technology, compare it by all means. Um, we can Google other cities around the world what is the best solution. We can shop for the best um, items now without having to go abroad and compare it. So um, technologies are there. It's up to the management to decide. It's up to the leaders. This is where the leadership comes in. Yeah. You are the one who decide what is the best thing for your city right now. And what, when you leave behind, what are your legacy for the next five to 10 years? Thank you, Nisha. All right, thank you. It's basically a good governance and due diligence and what is the priorities for your city. How, uh, Jeff, uh, what is your take on this? <laughs> I, thought that was, I thought those were fantastic interventions. I thought they were brilliant. Um, and just to pick up on um, uh, Noraini's comment about PPP is like marriage. Um, and my, my daughter is 12. And she is adorable and amazing and the most beautiful girl in the whole world. And thank God we're not quite to boys yet. Um, but I try to teach her about what she wants to look for. And when, when a girl comes to you and says, oh, I've met this man and he's wonderful. He's so handsome. Well, does he have a job? Oh, but he's so handsome. Well, is he nice to you? Oh, but he's so handsome. It's so tempting when those vendors come into your office with this great solution and it's look at how exciting it is. It has all these buttons and it has all these different things it can do. And isn't this brilliant And here? Why don't you buy this from me? And that's not what you want. You want someone that's going to go with you for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years and provide you with a solution as the technology changes. You don't want to be stuck with the same old thing. You want a partner that's going to see that things are going to change and they're going to change with you. 
this is really hard to do, right? And and which is why which is why Azrin is sitting in his room with all of his huge audience in front of him and sharing all these dynamics and brainstorming about these things because it's a constant relationship thing. And he mentioned um, just sitting with people, spending time with them, a year and a half to develop this. And by the way, I'm, I'm very um, I'm very jealous. He's got that pop star microphone. I want to get one of those because that looks really cool. Uh, but it's that relationship, right? And you and you get that relationship by spending time. It's not somebody in a beautiful suit that comes into your office and drives a nice car and has this really whizzy, exciting thing. It's a relationship, and together we're going to build this thing. And as Osborne was saying, you you share the revenues. So it's not just about I want to make my money and I'm going to move on to the next country or the next city or whatever the next project. It's about together we're going to build this thing, and as it gets more efficient, as it gets better, we both win. And that also pushes the city, because we don't want to take the pressure off the city either, right? City temptation is to say, all right, I've got my PPP, I can leave that now because it's solved. I've got a you know the LED lights for street lighting, the nice simple solution. All right, you guys take care of that. I'm going to move on to something else. City can't do that. It's a partnership. So the city officials have to stay engaged. They've got to stay plugged in. They've got to keep pushing. And the partners have to push each other to continue to get better and better and better. And that's when that passion comes in. That's when that excitement comes in. And the team that you've got building this thing, there's also a tendency in government for us to put a good team together. And they're very you know, dynamic and they're excited and, and they've got these great skills and they put the deal together. And then they move on to the next deal and the next deal and the next deal who's maintaining the first deal who's maintaining the second deal after it's been done right after we've all gotten excited and had a big party and we've got the the deals done hurrah aren't we excited and we put the note in the paper and we have the speeches the day after is when the real work starts who's going to do that work who's going to stay committed to this thing who's going to stay embedded and make it bring it from success to success to success it's a it's a lot of work, but the potential is fantastic. And just sorry, and apologies to go back to the COVID question, which is massive at the moment, right? The economic impact of this thing is just setting aside the humanitarian, the social, the the fear, the all the other yuck, right? Putting that aside, the economic impact is huge. So our tax revenues this year are going to be really bad. Next year, they're going to just be bad. <laughs> Hopefully the year after they get back to OK and then we get better and better. But in order to fill the gap, government is borrowing a lot of money, which is what they should do. They borrow a lot of money to fill the gap. That means that money needs to be paid back. So even after the revenues start coming back, our debt burden is going to be higher. That efficiency from smart cities is absolutely critical. The technology, all of that stuff is great. That's really important. But the efficiency you're looking for is huge. And that's how you're going to cut your costs, improve your revenues, improve the way your services are delivered. And that plus private sector bringing capital, that needs to be the order of priority. That efficiency, that partnership needs to come first. Bringing the money needs to come second. And, and fortunately, we have Maslin, who's going to who's got all these fantastic funds and can come and help us finance these things, which is fantastic, because if you're trying to stretch and get as much debt as possible, you're spending your energy and your focus on bringing in more debt. You're making the project more vulnerable. So it's got to be a nice balance between the two um, and bringing those pieces together. And COVID is pushing us really hard over the next couple of years to really focus on this. It's going to be a massive task without as much money as we're used to, without as much resource to bring in the experts. Um, so it's a tough time, but very exciting. Thank you. Indeed, smart, smart partnership is really required in order to get overcome the situation, current situation. All right, my next question. What are the issues and challenges in getting funding for smart city development? Mr. Bhaktia, what's your take on this? Uh, hi. Uh, the funding implement, uh, implementation uh, of smart cities in the city has always been an issue due to those following challenges. I would identify first challenge is to actually identify the business model. Uh, what is suitable and will be able to attract private funding. Right? Uh, 
and then there is an if there was a discussion mention of a technology risk just now that means to be able to get uh the project my first is kind uh one of its kind to be de de deployed with no proven track record and implementation will uh, or will be a challenge for investors or financiers to consider in the first place um and then uh as i said earlier you need to monetize monetize the benefit it's very difficult to identify uh, the monetary monetary uh, value of of uh, what can be delivered in terms of social economy. Uh, uh, it is it is difficult to identify these benefits and can be get uh, from the system. Uh, so it should is it is a very important factor that needs to be and be quite challenging. The other one is also actually to identify the uh, assessing the returns on investment. And it's, uh, for every project that you go in. Uh, you must be able to convince the financiers or investors that you it is a sustainable uh, project and it has potential growth. Uh, and again, uh, the issue of uh, uh, benefiting the social uh, society and uh, the citizens of the, of the city itself is also equally important. It has to be relevant to the citizens of the city and uh, it cannot be too technology technologically driven. It has to have that certain balance of uh, relatedness and also technology. Of course, data is also equally important uh, for, for the municipal councils and cities to consider, uh, especially to be able to identify uh, what would be the best uh, strategic plan or moving forward plan that the city should focus on. Because uh, you're right, cities have got a lot of issues that need to be uh, thought of. Uh, there, there must be factors that they need to consider, but with the data in hand, uh, I'm sure they are getting a lot of data to be able to crunch and uh, and massage that data. They'll be able to know which area of focus is best to get interest. And different cities require different uh, different uh, uh, requirements to fulfill for the citizens. So um, um, the, I, I identify those challenges basically as I say again the business model. The technology risk, but the difficulty in monetizing those benefits, and also to ascertain the returns on investment to each individual project. So these are the key things that the challenges that that uh, the, that to try to identify funding for smart cities. Thank you, Anusha. All right. Thank you, Mr. Batia. Tampaina Haja Nuraini, do you face the same challenges as what mentioned by Batia? Can you run that again, Anusha? Okay, uh, but, all right. The challenges that uh, to get the funding, issues and challenges to get the funding for uh, for your development, smart city development. Uh, what are the issues? The critical okay. issues that yeah. Um, every local authority have to do their budgeting. I mean, we have to do it now for next year. And normally we only plan what we can afford to pay because uh, local authority in Malaysia are not encouraged to issue um, to ha to to have loans or issue bonds. I mean, we can't issue bonds. I mean, unless um, the state allows it. So mostly our projects are quite limited to what we can afford. This is where uh, other local authorities may have that um, you know the, the the inability of implementing their smart city plan is uh, limited by the uh, the resources that they have right now. But um, suppose we are convinced enough that one project is um, uh, desired enough and important enough for us to ask for loan. How do we get that loan? The first place that we would go to is to the state department, uh, to the state of uh, state authority. Uh, the state may want to finance that project, but before that, some kind of credit rating must be done, whether you are liquid enough, whether you can afford to pay it in the future, because even with state, we don't ask from our parents, okay, give us some money, then they will give us just like that. No, um, in, in slang, <laughs> you would have to prove that you can pay it. I mean, they may, re, they may not charge you any interest rate. They may um, uh, forgive your loan later, but uh, in the beginning, you must convince that you have the ability to pay for it. So how do city decide that um, this is a project worth taking loan uh, from any other parties? But what we... 
from banks, which local authority very, very rarely do so. So this is where uh, Mr. Bahtiar and uh, Juan Mazlina may come in, um, teaching us how to make a project bankable. Uh, because it's about documenting, it's about evaluating, it's about um, rating. Um, uh, just like as Azri said, there is the cost part to it and there is the revenue part to it. If it's if the project is only of social benefit, of which we do not get back any revenue, then it is going to be quite difficult. No matter how much you monetize the social benefit, it's quite difficult to in the end to pay the bank later. So again, um, we we cannot do it alone. Local authorities are too small in Malaysia, except a few who are loaded enough, like maybe uh, our neighbor, Shalam. But uh, the rest of the local authorities have difficulty in financing their desired projects, their, the, the, the project that is important to them. And maybe they ha it, it, it has come a time that um, certain banks and certain financiers come and look at the project and how we can afford that. Thanks, Anisha. Okay, thank you, Juan. Ms. Maslina. Ms. Maslina, is it uh, based on your experience, is it hard for a municipal uh, to get a loan from the bank? Um, as I mentioned just now, I'm not in the operations side. Oh, okay. Uh, so I, I, I don't really can speak uh, on their behalf or, you know, the beha or on behalf of this uh, mm. pattern. But I think um, based on the... Um, financing uh, facilities that we have extended thus far mm -hmm. um, it's actually via a private partner so basically i think mm. the model is the private finance um, funding model uh, so it's basically through the vendor okay, okay. and for PV pvt projects okay mm. um, and i think the because of the um uh, what do you call this, this the special rates that we are giving to this kind of projects uh i think in a way it's much better than you know um for uh, uh, if the what do you call this the vendor or the the pbt themselves get the loans from other banks because this is actually specific uh, the, the ones that are actually being introduced under the uh, budget 2019 is actually specifically for, just for bank of all right yeah. and we, basically this is more to the public private partnership model yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, private finance initiative. It's basically uh, all right. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Right. Um, I have one question via YouTube for Town Planner Haja Noraini. All right. Do we need to rate our financial strength, uh, in a bracket credit rating before deciding, uh, the right partner? Madam Haja Nuraini. Okay, Anisha, our own ability to finance or to afford a project, I think is quite separate from the assessment of the partner itself. Okay, um, I think first we need to know ourselves before we engage with any partner. If we have decided that this is the project that we want and we want to finance it, whether through our own uh, money that we have in our reserves or through um, bank loans or the state government loans, then um, majority of the decision is made already. But if we are doing it with partners and the partners have this um, uh, PFI um, proposal, it will be financed by them, uh, but we, in a way, uh, either our revenue will pay for it later or we can pay for it in an incremental manner over a long period of time. Still, we would have to know what are the costs that is borne by the partners because eventually it will be um, burden to us. Uh, whether it comes from the revenue created, uh, it is to pay for whatever the cost that is said to be borne by the project proponent. So uh, knowing the business model, the 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 cost upfront and knowing our affordability, our own affordability is very, very crucial before we start, before we embark on any project. Yes, credit rating. Okay. 
<laughs> All right. So uh, are you intend to do credit rating for MPSJ? If we need to find loans, otherwise um, people don't need to know whether we are liquid enough or not. Uh, mm. But it comes to time and we have tested it before and we mm. are able to do so if we want to. Okay, thank you. Um, Jeff, I have one question for you. When implementing public-private partnership for smart cities, what are some of the biggest challenges you face? And what are some of more creative solutions you have found? Ooh. Creative, so, so actually, do you mind a, a quick comment on that credit rating question, which is a little bit of a warning. Sure. To, to manage that process very carefully, because you don't want um, a, a bad surprise. When you go through the process, you get the rating out the other side, you want to be able to manage that and, and manage the credit rating agencies that you provide the right information. And you might actually want to do a shadow rating or something first, just so that you know what your gaps are, where your weaknesses are, so you can improve them. So when you do get the rating, it comes out positive and very nice, a nice thing, a very useful thing. Um, as far as, as creative solutions, um, we work on all kinds of really fun stuff uh, around the world. And, and I guess one thing that I would encourage your audience is when you're thinking about um, smart city solutions and when you're thinking about PPP, don't forget that in addition to the immediate service you are providing, your solution and your PPP might be able to mobilize other revenues. Let me give you a very, very simple example. When you're a government and you're thinking about building a, a, a bus station, right? And I know I've got buses coming into town. The buses are parking all over the place. It's a mess. I need to build a bus station. So when government thinks about bus station, they think, all right, I need to spend $10 million to build a bus station. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to budget that amount. I'm going to build the bus station. A private partner, when you bring that partner in, sees the bus station, but they see customers. All these people are going to come to the bus station and I can provide them with all these services. So let's give them this service and that service and this service and that service. And then you make a lot of money off the bus terminal. So that terminal can actually be a source of revenue rather than just cost. And this is very true for public markets and other things. Make sure that you stay focused on the public service, but don't forget all the other opportunities. And so when you're creating your, especially a service platform, an IT app platform for municipal services, there are a lot of ways of using that same platform to then make money, make other revenues with advertising, definitely, but also with a lot of other services that you can provide over that platform. They may be great services, ones that everybody wants to use, really important um, and then you also bring in new revenue streams that then can help you pay for the fundamental public service that was really the focus in the first place um, but again don't forget to, to focus on the fundamental service it's so easy we do this a lot with airport projects for example you go to build an airport and the airport's very exciting but actually the land around the airport is really really exciting because there you can build office parks and IT parks and industrial parks, all focused on the airport and they'll make a lot of money. But there's a tendency when you bid out a PPP for an airport for the team that bids to focus more on the land than it does on the airport. And that's a disaster. When the team that you bring in your partner is no longer worried about your airport, they're worried about making lots of money off of land. And that's not that doesn't work. Um, so it's a tricky balance, but that would be my suggestion is, again, open-minded, flexibility, think about other ways of making money, and your private partner can be really helpful with this. Just make sure that they are aligned with your interests. Thank you, Jeff. Bhaktia, uh, what do you think, how, I mean, in your opinion, uh, how can a public-private partnership can be adapted for a funding uh, to to secure a funding? 
Ms. Bhaktia? Uh, you on mute. All right. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, thank you for the question. Now, uh, I believe um, in order for to establish a uh, public-private partnership, the first thing that uh, like, uh, uh, that was mentioned earlier, you have to have a, a corporate identity in order to be able to uh, apply for uh, funding, for finance for that matter. So I think one of the things that should be considered is for special purpose vehicle to be established. Uh, this uh, special purpose vehicle is probably a private limited company that's uh, having a representative equity shareholdings from both the private and public sector. So what it means is that the public sector and private sector is required to place an investment to the company. Uh, investments can be in the form of either assets or technology know-how uh, or cash for that matter. Uh, so uh, normally, it will be a 50-50 ratio with uh, equal risk uh, sharing both by the public and the private sector. But then that depends on uh, if you want to allow who would want to hold a majority of equity. It can be either the private sector, which will hold more, or the public sector, which will hold more. So depending on which party wants to hold better control of the project. Now, um, in terms of uh, uh, having this SPV, they will have all the, the rights to and obligations uh, to the project and will assume that all uh, cash flows, assets, liabilities related to the project will be challenged, will be channeled through the SPV, special purpose vehicle. Now, uh, taking that into consideration, uh, there are several areas where the uh, financing models of, for PPP can be considered. Uh, one, uh, which we consider uh, a project-based or equity financing model. Now, this is basically looking at the, the project itself, the value of it, and what it can be delivered. And also looking at the uh, amount of investment or equity that's in place by the SPV, to make it, uh, having a better financial spending, and to be able to apply to a private uh, uh, financier, which will consider them as a private entity, and, and, and of course, uh, having a, a, a sign or a, a project which has already been awarded or agreed with the municipal council. Okay, and then uh, another area, uh, of course, uh, with this equity financing, of course, if there is an asset inside the inside the SPV company, then they probably have to use the asset as security, as an example. Uh, it can be uh, also based on the project itself, where the project can show some viability for the finances to consider to place as uh, funding, provide funding. Now, uh, the other area is like uh, what was mentioned earlier, was uh, uh, public co-finance. That means the, uh, it's a form of public grant financing, which is actually funding coming from the pub, pub government uh, sector. Uh, but there is a shortfall in this, as, as indicated earlier. Uh, it depends on the budget that is available in order to complete the project. If you have limitations in budget, then you might, there are certain projects you not, might not be able to uh, pro provide, or um, they, you not be able to com complete uh, complete the whole, uh, what you hope to achieve, but you might want to go case by case, which will take a longer time. So there's some shortfalls in it. Now, the other one which was mentioned, also mentioned was actually private funding initiative model, whereby the company itself, uh, identify solely how to uh, like I said, monetize the, the benefits of the project itself to see how, um, again, the, uh, the demand for the society itself, the citizen, citizen itself, uh, to, to be able to use the product that is provided and be able to benefit. Uh, for example, uh, there was mention of uh, uh, public parking just now. Now, uh, uh, it be benefiting in the sense that we, you are able to find your spot before even arriving uh, at the area. Or the system can also identify where you should drive to in order to get a parking. So it tells you and it minimizes the wastage of time for you to go around looking for parking. So these are benefits. And if it improves the lifestyle of the citizens, I'm pretty sure they will come in on board and be able to also participate in the program. So it opens a lot of doors of opportunity in terms of um, advertising and information sharing 
and for the municipal council, we will also be able to identify if they are falling short of parking lots or they have room for further developments that need to be done, or better management of traffic flow, for that matter. So there are a lot of uh, improvements that can be made. So all this, if you can identify and be able to monetize and uh, be able to project it to the financiers, then we'll be able to not just depend on equity, you can just prevent and uh, depend on the the, find, find, find the the project itself to, to be able to get funding. And uh, it's just long term. Uh, it's not it's not one, two, three years, but more like 15 to 20 years uh, so that they, they, they can uh, uh, have a better returns in investment. So these are the areas where I feel that uh, some of the proposals that we should I mean, adopt it for PPP. Okay, thank you, Anisha. All right. Thank you, Ms. Bhaktia. Yes, a good, um, a good, uh, I mean, a lot of work had need to be put in order to prepare a good proposal. And not only that, a creativity and a good funding background, credibility of the company also required in order to convince the investors or municipal to take up the project. All right. My final question I have for uh, Haja Noraini, right? For a city that does not have much experience with public-private partnership, how would you suggest they start? And what are some of the key early work that needs to be done to improve likelihood of the success? Okay, um, we are not alone. The Malaysian Association of Local Authority, we have our Kementerian Perumahan Kerajaan Tempatan, and of course, we have our state government. For um, project feasibility, our the municipality's credit rating, whether to take up that particular project or not. Um, if any city feel that they lack the information, I mean, there is this network among us that we can always ask each other, and I believe now with the exposure to for Maslina, we can also ask our in the uh, financial sector to advise us. I mean, uh, Jeffrey has always been there. Uh, United Nations are always willing to help. Internationally, we have uh, UCLG, we have UN Habitat, we have ASCAP, um, my own PEMC, uh, PNLG networking. There's a lot of networkings out there that we can take advantage of and and um, you know specifically asking question if you ask jeffrey alone i mean he can channel you to so many people that can ask specifically and even can help you to towards this process it's our uh, willingness to you know be humble enough and ask i mean it's, it's not difficult <laughs> help is out there we are not alone that's my message yeah right about that it's just we have to work as a partnership uh, Jeff, uh, would you want to add on on this? <laughs> 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 what could I possibly add? I thought that was brilliant. I, and I think the, um, the, the willingness to ask is so important and not just of, you know, the World Bank and Asian Development Bank and so many other groups around who have, who have resource, but, but also internally within government, within, the, you know, amongst your colleagues, you got already in this session with Mike, you got a really great session of all this expertise that, that exists in Malaysia. You guys are very spoiled, frankly. In most of the countries that I work in, you don't have this. People are really scrambling. They have no one to sit next to them and, and help them through these problems. So, um, you know, it's not easy. It's not, I don't want to belittle the challenge, but I think you guys are in a really nice position to, to reach out around you and get a lot of support and, and make this a big success. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Um, we are almost ending our session. All right. Uh, we can conclude that public-private partnership is very important in creating a clear vision for a better collaboration between public and private sector. City authorities and industry players should break the silo and the tradi traditional barriers for getting the funding and financing source for smart cities development. The responsibility of city authorities related to the possibility of implementing the public-private partnership model in regards 
with the realization of the new and alternative ways of funding for smart cities development. Federal, state, and local government will increasingly encounter new partnership model for investment and revenue sharing. Also, for the private sector, they will expect to participate in long-term upside and downstream implementing opportunities. As a result, the private sector should encourage public sector investing in smart city development. With all the in this information and fruitful sharing by our panelists, we are able to open our thoughts and views for both cities, authorities and industry players to find better solution in financing smart city development. Thank you to our fellow panelists for today's discussion. I hope today's talk has benefit all. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar session. Please follow us on my Malaysia's Twitter, IG, Facebook, and website for further information. You can also contact the Secretariat to subscribe to Mike's webinar series. Have a nice day ahead. Thank you, everybody.